Good afternoon, everyone. We're here with Life on Purpose Live. We've got a tough topic, but one we cannot dig our heels in the sand on and not know about. We have Todd Nettleton with Voice of the Martyrs today. We're going to talk about persecuted Christians. And Todd, welcome. I'm glad this is your second time to be here with me on this show. Thank you so much. It is good to talk to you. You know, you you hear about persecuted Christians, especially in our country, and we're like, oh, I'm so glad that's far away. And what we're going to talk about today is the rescue of 13 that were wrongly imprisoned in Etria. Etria? Eritrea. Eritrea. I knew I wasn't <laughs> going to get it right. And Eritrean Christians that were wrongly accused that have been in jail for 10 years, and there's still more in there. So let's talk about the great news of that rescue. How did that happen? Yeah, this is really amazing news. 13 Christians released from prison in Eritrea, six men, seven women, all of them at least 10 years in prison. So these are not people who were arrested last week and they let them go this week. They have all been in prison for 10 years. And so this is a significant answer to prayer. Here's a little bit of background. So on July 22nd, there are two pastors in prison in Eritrea. July 22nd was their 7,000th day in prison. So more than 19 years they have been in prison. We sent out an email to all of our Voice of the Martyrs readers and said, hey, these two pastors have been in prison for 7,000 days. We want you to commit to pray for Christians in prison in Eritrea. We also encourage people to send a fax, send an email to the Eritrean embassy. So that that email from us went out on Saturday morning by Tuesday afternoon. I think we had crossed 10,000 people who had said, yes, I will pray for Christians in Eritrea who are in prison. Yes, I'll send a fax. We don't know how many faxes, how many emails. We do know at one point the email address of the Eritrean embassy was bouncing emails. So either their box was full or they had turned off their server. And then on Friday morning, we received word these 13 Christians have been released. Now, unfortunately, those two pastors were not among these 13. But what an amazing answer to prayer. So many people praying for Christians in Eritrea. And then just literally days later, 13 of them walk out of prison. That is amazing. And so so how many are left in that same prison? Here's the bad news. So we the, the number right now is between 350 and 400 Christians that are currently in prison in Eritrea. Now, in some ways, that's good news. A, a few years ago, it was 3,000 Christians who were in prison in Eritrea. So it is down considerably from the highest point that it was. But of all of those Christians who are in prison, and I think for us as Americans, this is kind of shocking to us, not a single one of them has had a trial not a single one of them has had a lawyer or a chance to defend themselves. In fact, not a single one of them has been formally charged with a crime. They simply got arrested. They disappear into the prison system. And in the case of those two pastors, we're now more than 19 years later. They're still in prison. And so one of the things that, that really breaks my heart on behalf of these brothers and sisters is, it's not like they have a prison sentence. It's not like they've been sentenced to 25 years and they can kind of count down the days and and know, well, if I can make it five more years, then I'll get out. They don't know if they'll get out tomorrow or a year from now or never. There is no sentence. There is no justice. There is no information for them. Uh, and I think, at least from my perspective, that would be one of the hardest parts about suffering persecution in Eritrea is just the unknown. Yeah, yeah. That is so tough. So, and these people were wrongly accused. Give us some examples of what they said they were accusing them of, that they would throw them in this prison and keep them there for all these, I mean, years. Well, let me give you a little bit of background. So if we go back to 2002, the Eritrean government called in the leaders of most of the evangelical churches in the country, every church that wasn't Catholic, Orthodox, or Lutheran, their leadership was called in to a meeting with the government, and they said, your churches are closed. <laughs> Start, starting today, your churches are closed. Uh, and so literally from one Sunday to the next, they went from open public worship services in their church buildings to an underground church situation, meeting in private homes, meeting outdoors, meeting underground, secret meetings for the church. And so the arrests started shortly after that. Christians started being arrested. Oh, and the reason for it, and I'm glad you asked this, the, the perception is Christians are not patriotic citizens. Uh, 
President Afwerki, the president of Eritrea, was educated in China. He was educated under that communist ideology that religion is bad. Uh, religion takes your loyalty away from the state, away from the party. Uh, and so Christians are seen as unpatriotic. They won't they don't love their country as much as they love Jesus, which, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Hopefully that's true for all of us. Um, right. And so that is the perception that that they don't cooperate with the government. They don't do what the government asks. They are unpatriotic. And so they're seen as a threat by President Afwerki and his government. Oh, so these people are thrown into prison simply because they're they're Christians and they're they're doing what God's called them to do. They don't get letters. They don't get visitors. They don't get attorneys. They don't get a phone call. They get nothing. And so it's just an indefinite, like you said, I mean, that's a prison in and of itself because you have no hope of, I mean, prayer, obviously, yes. And I know they're praying, but I mean, this is really, really um, wrongly accusing someone and then terribly treating our Christians and brothers. And this is something that should anger all but you know most of us don't know what's happening around the world so address that for us because we need to know what's going on abroad yeah this is such an important thing for us to understand you know the bible talks about when one part of the body of christ suffers all of us are supposed to feel that pain all the other parts of the body if we're disconnected, if we don't have any connection or any contact with our brothers and sisters who face persecution, we can't follow that scripture. We can't obey that scripture. We can't feel their pain because we don't know anything about them. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that really is one of the crucial ministries of the Voice of the Martyrs is to connect up the body of Christ and to remind uh, American Christians, hey, you have family members in Eritrea. You have family members who are in prison in Eritrea so that we can feel their pain. We can be connected to them and minister to them and encourage them and pray for them. Um, and that's, like I say, that's one of the key parts of the Voice of the Martyrs ministry. And you, your donation base. So if someone's thinking, gosh, there's nothing I can do about my brothers and sisters across the world, there is something they can do because they can support Voice of the Martyrs because that's what y'all do all the time, right? Uh, you certainly can support us financially the other way. And, and actually, I would say even more important is you can pray. Uh, yeah. When I think about 10,000 people saying they're going to pray for Christians in Eritrean prisons and then 13 of them walk out, boy, I hope all of us are motivated to keep praying, praying for Christians mm -hmm. in Eritrea and China and Iran and North Korea and all the nations where they are persecuted. And frankly, that's the first thing they ask us to do. When, when we go and meet with persecuted Christians, we ask that question, hey, I'm going to go back to America. I'm going to do interviews like this one. I'm going to write for the Voice of the Martyrs magazine. How can American Christians help you? The first thing they say is pray for us. And mm -hmm. the really challenging thing to me is their prayer request is not, hey, pray that we won't be persecuted. Their prayer request is pray that we'll be faithful to Christ in spite of our persecution. And so uh, I hope as we hear about these in Eritrea, I hope we are motivated to pray for brothers and sisters who are suffering for doing stuff that we take for granted, for having a Bible, for gathering with other believers, for praising the Lord, for studying the word. Those are things we kind of take for granted in a lot of places that can get you thrown in jail. Mm. And, you know, we don't really think about that here because we think, you know, that's in the third world countries and things like that. But we have seen a taste of that here. And while we're, you know, we don't, don't know persecution like they do, you said one of the best ways to understand the persecution of others and to become involved in it is to understand their stories. What do you mean by that? How can that turn into action for us? Well, I think as we look around in our own country, we clearly see the cultural winds turning against biblical truth. And yes. uh, though you can see a day where we might be persecuted, we might pay a price for gathering with other believers, for having a Bible, those things. The analogy that I like, and we're just getting ready to start football season, so it fits really well right now, is, hey, you know, if I'm going to play the Patriots this coming Sunday— I want to watch the video of the team that beat the Patriots last Sunday. I want to mm -hmm. see, hey, what plays did they run? How did they run their offense? How did they run their defense? What did they do to win that game? The same is true. If I'm going to be persecuted for my faith a year from now, I want to watch the video of somebody who's already been persecuted, and they came out of it with their faith intact, with a smile on their face, 
testifying to the faithfulness of God and to his graciousness to them. Those are the stories that I want to read, that I want to understand if I'm going to face persecution. And so, you know, I encourage American Christians, if you see persecution on the horizon, read your Bible, make sure you're reading your Bible and study the stories of Christians who have already been persecuted and were victorious in the midst of that. And Voice of the Martyrs is an amazing resource for that in, in video, in books, in our free monthly magazine, in Voice of the Martyrs radio. We are all about telling the stories of persecuted Christians who were victorious in the midst of their persecution. Yeah. I think that's incredible because that's what you do all day, every day. So what do you say to people who they're, they're looking at the world and they're like, oh my gosh, I just want everything to go back to normal. What are we going back to normal ever as what we think of normal? <laughs> uh, well, Jesus said in this world, you will have trouble. Um, so if we have trouble, we shouldn't really be surprised by it because it's exactly what Jesus said would happen. But the other thing I would encourage people, if you look at the places on planet Earth where the church is growing the fastest and where more people are coming to know Jesus than even here in the U.S., it is places where there is hardship, there is persecution. The mm -hmm. fastest growing church in the world right now is in the Islamic Republic of Iran, well, that's not because they have more freedom than we do. It's not because their government is more pro-Christian than ours is. It's not. But the church is growing. God's kingdom is advancing. So uh, I would encourage people to keep that eternal perspective. It is easy to get our eyes sort of down on what's going on around us and, and maybe the trouble and the trials that we're facing. But keep that eternal perspective and understand God's kingdom can advance Regardless of the trouble, regardless of what the government policy is, his kingdom can advance in any situation. Yeah. And so many people feel like, I don't know what to do, so people don't do anything. Again, they, they default to, I'm just going to wait till I, I know when things are going to start to look normal. When we can't put hope in our government. We can't put hope in a political system. I mean, our hope has to be in Christ. And so we have to become engaged and become part of the solution. Because where we see a problem, if God put us in a time where there's problems, then is it not safe to assume that we are here to be a solution to that problem? You know, I think that's one of the lessons of our persecuted brothers and sisters is in times of trial. And I even think of these Eritrean brothers that are in prison right now. We have heard some stories of ministry happening within those prisons. So they didn't go to prison and think, "Uh oh, now I'm in prison. God must, you know, he must want me to just be locked up and be quiet for these years. They said, oh, I'm in prison. There must be a ministry that God has for me here. And I think that's a challenge for us. Hey, I didn't want to be in the emergency room today, but maybe there's a ministry for me here. Hey, I didn't want to be in the unemployment line today, but maybe God has a ministry for me here. Uh, through whatever challenges, whatever trials we're going through, if we keep our eyes open, God can direct us and he can use us even in situations we didn't want to be in. Yeah. And you've been with Voice of the Martyrs for so long. How long have you been with, with them? <laughs> 25 years this year. <laughs> 25 years. So what's different now than when you started years ago? As far as Voice of the Martyrs? Well, as far as the, the accelerated pace of persecution around the world and y'all's ministry and the acceleration of what's happening. You know, I, I think... One of the things that is happening, and, and yes, we do see more persecution, but part of the reason for that is there are more Christians. There are more Christians in Iran to be persecuted. There are more Christians in China to be persecuted. And so, yes, we see the persecution numbers go up, uh, but we also know that part of the reason for that is because the church is growing. There are more potential targets for persecution. One of the other things that that is kind of maybe not what you intended with the question, but just technologically, the ability to know what's going on in some of these countries. Uh, a person can be arrested this morning or, or taken to the police station for interrogation, and we can have that information and have it on our Facebook page this afternoon and say, hey, this pastor has just been taken to the police station. We need you to pray right now because right now is when he's being interrogated that kind of immediacy is really a blessing. And, and we kind of think of it as real-time fellowship with our brothers and sisters who are suffering, where, you know, 25 years ago, it might have been a letter that took weeks to get here, and then it took weeks more to kind of figure out exactly what was going on. And, and then we could say, okay, yes, we know that this happened. 
the technology gives us the ability to speak very quickly about what is happening. And it's harder for these governments to hide what they're doing. As I think about the Eritrean government locking up all these Christians, 25 years ago, they might have been able to do that sort of quietly and without the world knowing. Today, we know what they're doing and we can speak out against it. Oh, man. So, you know, you talk about the church growing in many other nations, Islamic nations, and we know that, we see that. I've read lots of stories on that. But it's declining here in America where we have the freedom to worship, we have the freedom to go to church. Are we just taking for granted our freedom to do all those things? I mean, we we are not appreciative of what we have, are we? <laughs> I think you're right. I think we are not appreciative. And, uh, you know, I think about some of the things that, believers in hostile and restricted nations do to share the gospel. They give out New Testaments. They give out copies of the Gospel of John. For them, it could mean going to prison. For us, it could mean maybe an awkward conversation or a little bit of embarrassment. But how many of us are doing it? They hear someone that says, hey, I'm having trouble in my marriage. And they say, hey, let me pray for you right now in the name of Jesus. Let me pray that God will move in your marriage and, and change things for you. We have the freedom to do that. Maybe, again, we would suffer an awkward conversation or, or maybe a little bit of embarrassment, a little bit of rejection, but we're not going to jail for doing that. Right. But how many times do we do it? How many times do we step into that freedom and really use it to build the kingdom of God? And so I think it is a challenge for us. And, and some of it is we have been so free for so long that we just kind of can't imagine not being free. And, and we do tend to take it for granted. And, and I, I'm pointing a finger at me too. I'm not just pointing a finger at other people. This, this is preaching to me as well. Yeah. And one of the things that I also think that we underestimate, and we're going to go back to your point of the miracle of the 13 releases, is the power of prayer. If we were really praying like we should be, we'd be seeing the change that we really believe God's going to send to us. Is that correct? I, I think it is true. And, and one of the interesting things about the persecuted Christians that I've had the chance to meet is their total reliance on God. They don't have the opportunity to rely on the government or to rely on the police to protect them or to rely on their financial resources or, you know, their church building or whatever. They have to wake up every morning and say, God, if you don't step into my life today, it's, there's going to be a lot of trouble for me. Please step in and help me. We tend to rely on a lot of those structures. And, and again, this is a blessing of our lives is that we do have a stable government. We do have police who generally protect us and are on the side of, of law and legality. And so we do think, yeah, I can, if something bad happens, I can call the police. They're going to come and help me. Yes, that's great. That's a wonderful blessing. But ultimately, our reliance is not on the police. It's not on our paycheck. It's not on the laws of our country. Our reliance needs to be on God. And, and that's one of the lessons I think that persecuted Christians teach us is, again, that eternal perspective of, sure, it's great to have the passport that I have, but ultimately my citizenship is in heaven and my reliance is on God. Yeah, that's incredible. And it's, it's so true. And, you know, anytime you've ever been in a real crisis, you get a real a, a touch of that. Not anything like what I think they're feeling, but you do you do get real serious about your prayer life. So just two quick questions and then we'll end. So on the rest of those that are wrongly accused, you're asking people to pray for them now so we can experience the same miracle for them. So what does that look like of people getting involved and in doing that? Well, we have set up a website, persecution.com slash Eritrean prisoners. And I would encourage you to sign up on that website. Just It's just a commitment. Yes, I'm, I'm going to join in this prayer meeting. I'm going to pray for Christians in prison in Eritrea. After you sign up on the second page, there is a advocacy mechanism. So we give you the email address of the Eritrean embassy. We give you the fax number for the Eritrean embassy. We give you actually even a sample letter. If you want to work from that or you just want to copy and paste that, to help you be able to know kind of what to say and how to approach it with them. So we want people to keep praying. We want people to keep contacting the embassy. And my prayer is all 350 plus of those Christians will be out of jail soon. Amen. In Jesus name, we pray and agree. So final question, what does the next two, three, five years look like for Voice of the Martyrs? 
Well, we will continue to serve our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. One of the things about VOM's work is we are very much field driven. And so we don't sort of arrive in a country and say, hey, here's a menu of what we do. Uh, we arrive in a country with the idea of coming alongside the Christians who are there and saying, hey, what do you need us to do? How can we possibly help you in this time of suffering, this time of trial? One of the places where persecution is growing is on the African continent. Uh, we just had a project not long ago in Ethiopia. There is a lot of persecution in Ethiopia right now. Uh, you think about the Sahel region, Burkina Faso and Niger and some of those countries we see the growth of radical Islam, and that is meaning more persecution for our Christian brothers and sisters. So I, I'm sure in the next three to five years, our work in Africa is going to expand uh, just because persecution of our brothers and sisters there is expanding as well. Yeah. So if anyone knows about persecution, they can tell you because that's what you do. You have the team in place. You are the um, the sounding, the voice, the activities. I mean, you, you've done this for a long time, so y'all know how to deal with this. So I just say that because if people know about anything, that, that you're a great resource to go to because this is what you've been doing, and this is exactly what you've been doing for a long time. So I'm glad to know y'all are doing what you're doing. Well, thank you very much. And our website again is persecution.com. We would love to hear from people. Uh, you can sign up for the free magazine there as well. Uh, but we, it is our privilege to serve these members of the body of Christ around the world. Yeah. And thank you for doing it. And thank you for sharing the miracles when they happen. And thank you for allowing other people to be a part of the next ones. And we will definitely put those links in the comments so people can get involved. That would be great. Thank you for having me the, today. Thank you, Todd. Thank you so much for all you do. Blessings on all the whole team and all that you're doing. And I pray that the Lord would just put his hands heavy on you. So he just empowers you to go do what so much needs to be done. Amen. 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 All right. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Thank you.